right, welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Cameron Khojaev. Uh, Cameron is the Chief Commercial Officer and a co-founder of Coop. Coop is an insurance technology company that specializes in serving the autonomous vehicles market. Uh, Cameron, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much for inviting. Appreciate it. It's good to have you on. We've been hanging out for a while. And yeah. uh, I just wanted to have a drink with you I've, and get uh, to know you better. So. Always been curious about your uh, your. Uh, podcast space it's actually really cool thank a little, you a little, little chilly yeah it is i was gonna warn you and then i uh got tied up in something and didn't so i'm sorry yeah, about that no problem but but thanks for the drink hey my pleasure yeah we're having manhattan cheers uh, cheers mm-hmm. so you were telling me before i screwed up the intro and i guess i'm interested to know how does an insurance technology company differ from a traditional insurance company well uh we know traditional insurance companies like um Geico, yep. right? Um, uh, the Hartford, you know, Travelers and all. Um, those are uh, great big insurance companies that's uh, been in the market for a while. They write traditional insurance policy. Uh, however, we are a technology company first. Uh, so we are building our technology products and uh, structuring uh, insurance company on top of it. <clears throat> so uh, that's the major difference. Uh, and our goal is to uh, um, uh, understand and uh, analyze autonomous vehicle risks, uh, which are the new risks yeah. uh, that are uh, unfamiliar to a, to a wider uh, insurance audience. As somebody who's tried to purchase insurance for a robotics company, the NSKA, uh, it's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> so, I believe you. Yeah. yeah I, well, what I, what I found when I was shopping with First National in particular, um, and I think we put up a few other quotes, but Mm-hmm. Progressive, I think, as well. We tried early on, and they weren't a good fit either. Um, right. But you know, nobody really wanted to take the time to try to understand this mm-hmm. industry, and so yeah. it was a tremendous pain. And uh, I think my uh, yeah. I finally found an insurance agent that specialized a mm-hmm. little bit in robotics, uh, not to the extent that Coop does, but you know, yeah. more than the other people I could find. And his words to me were, "I think if you had ever had to file a claim with Progressive, you would have shoot, sued your insurance agent." <laughs> Uh, right, uh, that might be the case. Uh, but what we do is uh, our goal is to be what they call insurance market. Okay. Uh, which means that there's also a form of a company called MGA, Managing General Age, whereas uh, Coop has the capability and flexibility to underwrite uh, policies based on uh, our technology product and the, the data analysis that we have and underwriting models that we're building. Uh, that's different than an agency, right? So okay. the agency works uh, is more of a client-facing uh, function, uh, and they uh, service the clients and, and their needs to uh, procure uh, the most competitive insurance on their behalf. Now, <clears throat> uh, potentially, uh, we, uh, we have some aspirations to uh, build that MGA for wider robotics companies as well. And that is going to be interesting because there will be an opportunity to put a special language around the use case of the robotics, uh, which will uh, kind of alleviate the pain point where you get uh, misclassified maybe uh, from an insurance perspective and uh, potentially get involved in this uh, lawsuit process and being able <laughs> to get covered or not covered. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. I'm definitely excited to learn more kind of as the, the platform develops and maybe hopefully try it out at some point. That seems like a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, super excited about that. And uh, hopefully we can do it in the nearest future. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so what made you decide you wanted to go down this road? I mean, like, um, I don't know. It's just like kind of a non-traditional path. How did you get there? Uh, well, um, let me take a step back. So sure. h- how am I in Pittsburgh, right? So uh, I... Uh, applied to different colleges when I was back in my country, uh, you know, Uzbekistan cool. from the capital, Tashkent. Nice. So I applied to different colleges and uh, I looked at University of Pittsburgh and then I Googled pictures. I liked it. I applied. Uh, but uh, what's funny is that I saw the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford and that's a satellite campus. And I got first, confused by Johnstown when I'm mm-hmm. applying to Pitt as well. Right, Johnstown, Bradford, and they have a Titusville campus, beautiful places. And uh, I uh, ended up in Bradford, oh, but, cool. but, but I thought that all of them are the same thing. You're the only one I know that went to Bradford. That's yeah, awesome. so I went to Bradford for, for a few years, and then I transferred to the main campus. Cool. And uh, Bradford uh, experience was uh, 
uh, great. They have a beautiful campus there. Uh, but I want it to be in a bigger city. Yeah, and, makes sense. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Especially if you're from a city. <laughs> yeah, I'm from a city of uh, almost three and a half, four million. Uh, Quite a bit bigger than Pittsburgh. Yeah, unofficially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then they, I transferred to University of Pittsburgh main campus in Oakland. And uh, that's where I went to school uh, and uh, met my co-founders. Yeah. I think it's um, bigger than Pittsburgh. I don't know the population figures. But... Right. <laughs> And uh, I liked Pittsburgh a lot. So uh, uh, meeting my co-founders and then us taking different paths, I ended up uh, working for the VC fund and then the telematics uh, portfolio company of it. And uh, I saw, I did mostly business development. So my background is non-technical. Cool. Uh, and uh, I uh, got introduced to the world of uh, insurance technology, safety, um, in, in the trucking space. That's awesome. Yeah. As a technical guy, I always kind of envied the business development guys because <clears> they were cooler. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't think that's true anymore. I think it used to be true. I don't know that it is yeah. anymore either. But yeah, when I right. was coming up, it was true. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah so uh, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting story. So um, uh, I started working uh, at a, a selling uh, safety and fuel efficiency technology product into the trucking space. Oh, cool. And... Uh, it was really tough sales. What so, was the product, if I can ask? So it pretty much, it, it's a mobile application that has the routing function, uh, but at the same time, it can track your driving behavior and uh, also uh, notify you what risky roads you're approaching. Oh, cool. So there is an aggregation of uh, public uh, road data from um, uh, uh, FMCSA, right? So I don't know that organization, but... Right, uh, and uh, they pretty much aggregate all the crash data, so they pinpoint where which area of the highway is. Oh, and if there's a bunch of crashes, you can deduce that it's dangerous. Yeah, the yeah. historical crashes, they just aggregate it, and they can tell which areas are riskier, and that app speaks to the driver that he or she approaching a risky area. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but selling into the trucking industry is incredibly uh, difficult um, and uh, competitive. Trucking companies, they uh, are so focused on delivering goods, servicing their customers. And uh, there are there were big players in, in the space. <clears throat> and the company I worked with was uh, with, with, with smaller. Uh, nevertheless, I got great experience. Nice. Um, yeah. So uh, I got immersed into the insurance space, which is really important. Uh, and I found cool. it fun. Yeah. Awesome. And it's important to be like that, right? Because, I mean, you spend most of your waking hours at work. If you're not enjoying it, it kind of means mm -hmm. you know, your life maybe isn't the best. <laughs> well, I was enjoying it, but yeah. then I I also lived in Pittsburgh. So I saw all these developments happening in um, autonomous vehicle space. Um, autonomous trucking, robot taxi, and other things. And then I realized, wait a second, right? Um, if uh, we'll have autonomous vehicles, these telematics technologies will have a hard time uh, being there, right? Even if it's a long term, right? Uh, then I realized that uh, this is an extremely interesting space. And uh, uh, I have great co-founders, uh, super smart fo smart uh, folks. Cool. Uh, uh, my co-founder, Sergey, I met him at Pitt. And nice. Jim, I met him at Pitt too. Awesome. And after that, we met our CTO, uh, uh, co-founder and, and CTO Zach, who was uh, working at uh, Uber ATG Sweet. on, on self-driving vehicles. So, uh, and, and Sergey actually was working uh, in New York as an investment banker. Cool. So, uh, uh, we and uh, worked on a lot of quantitative models and stuff. So uh, we have like a great balancing skill sets there, uh, which is really important for uh, for a startup. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, you definitely right. need yeah. people that are willing to do everything but specialize in one particular thing. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's really, really cool. I uh, started some little teeny startups with some of my other Pitt uh, mm -hmm. cohorts. Oh, yeah, nothing... you went to Pitt too. I did, yeah, right. for undergrad. Right. Yeah. yeah, cheers. Hail to Pitt. <laughs> what, what, what years did you go to? I uh, graduated in 2013. And I think I was there for like two years before that. So like 2011 to 20, I transferred as well, but I transferred from a different school. So I was mm -hmm. at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. And mm -hmm. then uh, I didn't love Cleveland. So I decided to come to Pitt. Yeah. Are you from Pittsburgh though? Uh, I am. Okay. I grew up in yeah. Squirrel Hill. So. Good to be back home. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 
Well, I've, I've lived all over the country. Like I, I spent some time in Los Angeles. I spent a little bit of time in Milwaukee, Connecticut, Boston, uh, Utah briefly. Um, but I always find myself coming back to Pittsburgh. Because it's, I don't know. It's reasonable right. to live here. Like you're not spending yeah. a buttload of money. Right. And right. it's, it's, so you I, have your nomadic lifestyle already. Yeah. Well, and I, I think I'll keep moving around. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be a point in my life where like I try another city that I haven't been in. I still haven't lived outside the U.S., which I want to do. So I would like to like get a job in, you know, I don't know, Europe or Asia. Yeah, if you go to Japan. Bit. I've heard yeah. great things. Yeah, you should go to Japan, definitely. Yeah. Uh, but I think my, yeah. uh, my boss at Formlogic wants to retire there. He was saying like Tokyo is his favorite city. So. Super, never been. Never been. I haven't either. I would like to go. It's it's on my list. Yeah, uh, super. Um, and me too, actually. I would love to visit that country. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for me, it's always been a dream to come to U.S. That's awesome. And, and, and go to school here. Uh, so when I was graduating, actually, I uh, uh, I was accepted to uh, school in London. Uh, cool. Westminster. That's a really uh, good and, school. Uh, yeah, and uh, I... This, I was almost that close to actually going there, but... Uh, it's a great city. I love London. Uh, yeah, me too. I love it. Uh, <laughs> been there many times and actually lived there. Not nice. For two I've long. only ever visited a couple of times, but I like it a yeah. lot. And when I came to Pitt, I actually did an exchange uh, with uh, with London. So I spent my semester there. Nice. It was a, a great time, great experience. Uh, but overall, I, I liked... Uh, so I, I, I always wanted to live in a bigger country yeah. uh, where I could travel from state to straight, state, have road trips and uh, that kind of thing. Do you do that a decent simple. amount? Uh, sometimes. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. What, what's the last road trip you did? Well, uh, we drove to Miami with our team. Oh, that's awesome. That was uh, interesting. 18 hours of driving. Uh, even though I... I love those long hauls, <clears> to be yeah. honest. And uh, what was not fun is the fact that I had my second COVID vaccine done right before. <laughs> so uh, I was uh, 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 on the back in the back seat. I think I was texting or I called you around then because you were telling me about that. Yeah, I was uh, yeah. I was pretty, uh, pretty feeling pretty sick. So <laughs> somebody else was nice enough to drive at least. Yeah, my, my co-founders, they, they switched and drove, but it was a That's great awesome. trip to Miami. Uh, and uh, we spent some time to, in, in Miami doing work there. Uh, and uh, it was um, it was before we we, we we raised funds and it was a great experience. That's really cool. Yeah, I did um, Austin, Texas last year just for vacation, mm -hmm. but I went Nashville on the way out, and then I did um, I want to say Atlanta on the way back in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then my longest one I ever did was I did Pittsburgh to Los Angeles in three days. Wow, so that's, that's like so four thousand miles. <laughs> did you stop? Uh, I did. So I, I actually I didn't. It was after I graduated undergrad, I worked an internship for SpaceX before I went to grad school. And I, um, they gave us like a, you know, it was like an intern budget. So it was like $99 a night for hotels. And I didn't stay in a single hotel because I had a lot of friends right. throughout my life, you know. So I stayed with an ex-girlfriend in Cleveland. Then yeah. I stayed with my uncle in Chicago. Then I stayed with my buddy David in Nebraska and Omaha. And then right. uh, through all the flat states, me and my friend drove in shifts. I, I had a buddy uh, who's a flight attendant who flew in for free to Chicago to meet me. Him and I drove in shifts through all the flat states. And then, and uh, I shouldn't, I mean, there are some good states, but just, you know, yeah. didn't know anyone there to stay with. And so, and I was poor. And so that's right. what I did. How was the uh, internship at SpaceX though? Uh, it was, uh, it was arduous. It was, it was a lot of long hours, but it was fun. I mean, I, I got to. You know how like when you're a kid and, and you yeah. go to the science museum and you're inspired? I right. mean I don't think a science museum will ever do it for me again after after working in a place like that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, some of the things I mean, I'm sure you've been around in your professional career and I've been around. You're you're in a museum and it's 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 the old shit, you know, and, and we get to work around the new shit and we're fortunate in that way. And so like you know, I mean, I, I don't think you can go back from that. You know, I mean, when you when you sit in, you know, like this was been, would have been in 2013, and I got to sit in a prototype for the manned uh, dragon before it was announced to the public that we had a manned, you know, capsule, mm -hmm. and so that was really cool just to be, you know, able to not only know about but inhabit that sort of thing, and then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're in a literal rocket factory. I mean, and and I was in there pretty early on, and so. Did you meet Elon? Um, I was in the same room as him twice, but it wasn't yeah. like a one-on-one -on -one thing. It was more like okay. a Q&A where he yeah. was addressing the company. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Very impressive. 
it was neat. I mean, and you know, the, the hours were long. I mean, my first Friday there was a 19 hour day. Um, so it was, it was pretty insane, but, um, it was an interesting work culture. I mean, I used to work in food service, um, as I was a bus boy and a line cook, and I, I used to think I wanted to be a chef. And so I, I made friends with the, the kitchen staff there and I, you know, and I, as I do in a lot of places where I go now and, um, you know, friends at the Culinary Institute of America and all over, uh, and the guy I was talking to when you came in as a chef. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, I would talk to those guys and they were all poached from the Playboy Mansion. And so, um, I'm like, where were you working before this? Like the Playboy Mansion, Elon got us from Hugh Hefner. You know? so, that is funny. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, super. Well, now you're here, uh, building robots. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that's what I've been doing for pretty much my whole professional career at this point. I mean, I SpaceX, I was working it cause I took what I could get, but yeah, I mean, since then all my jobs have been in robotics and kind of been making a name for myself and getting better at it. I, as are you. Yeah, super. <clears throat> have you actually seen any of the self-driving car companies up close? I mean, I'm sure you have. Uh, yeah. So uh, being in Pittsburgh, uh, I used to, I've actually took a Uber ATG ride nice. when uh, they had self-driving cars running. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, I've, uh, you can see uh, Argo cars around. Yeah. Uh, especially in the strip district area. And uh, I actually saw one, a couple actually in Miami. Nice. Wait, in Miami? Yeah. I didn't know they were testing yeah. there. That's awesome. They were testing in Miami and I saw a couple uh, and I was like, oh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Have you spent much time in Arizona or like the Bay Area? Uh, I went to Bay Area and I saw uh, Cruise. Uh, the Waymo cars are Waymo interesting. Cars. I've yeah. seen those. And I, I actually stayed at a, a, a hotel downtown and... Uh, right across the street from the hotel was a parking lot and i think that's where they parked a lot of those vehicles because Interesting. every morning they'd be just rolling out and driving that's cool uh, and uh, you see uh, zooks there as well and it's very exciting yeah i completely yeah. agree i wish one day i could just not drive <laughs> nice yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, and get those uh, cheap uh, autonomous vehicle rides uh, all over the place it's great. Yeah. I mean, it's a cool technology. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've been inside of some of those companies as well. Um, and what I would say is like, I know you're a non-technical background. I, I do have a technical background. So I know when I look at those cars, what I'll do is I immediately go to like the sensors. I'm like, okay, it looks like they've got two Velodyne pucks on either mirror. It looks mm -hmm. like they've got one pointed down in front of it. They probably have a Delphi radar unit under that bumper because it's plastic if I had to guess. And then I see that 64 HE up top. What do you look at when you see one of those cars? I'll be totally honest, design. Nice. It's not <laughs> awesome. You know how they look like. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that, 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 you know, it's just something really cool about it. Um, and uh, if I had to uh, take an autonomous vehicle right in the future, in the nearest future, hopefully, uh, I would pick the one with coolest design. Like, yeah, oh, coolest sure. looking vehicle. <laughs> uh, I really... Uh, I look at it from, from that angle. Yeah, right. that's super cool. Uh, more technical people would look at the equipment like yourself. I'm a fucking nerd. I mean, yeah. like, I, I will just dig into that. And right. um, for me, I mean, that's, I don't think you can, it's it's like I said with space, like you can't unsee certain things. I mm -hmm. mean, and so I think the fact that I know what those sensors are and what it takes to interface them and the type of compute it takes and all the program, and that's all I can see now, you know, it's just like, you can't right. unleave the matrix or whatever. Absolutely. So. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, yeah, I would say design is great too. Um, in my work, I always try to get a design perspective involved because, I mean, I don't know, I feel better about work that I'm proud to show my friends. And if it's badly designed, I'm not proud to show it to my friends. I bet, yeah. yeah. Cool. And, you know, we're very excited to be in this space. And uh, we believe in the exponential growth. Um, and uh, we focus on uh, primary on-road use cases, uh, whether it's an uh, autonomous truck uh, performing long haul or short haul or interstate rides, right? Uh, Robo taxis. That's awesome. Um, de and deliveries as well. That's a great market. So uh, on-road autonomous vehicles uh, where they add significant value. I mean, you're seeing right now with what's happening in the 
transportation industry uh, with the shortage of drivers, <clears throat> with uh, uh, certain issues in regards to uh, uh, HOS rules and, and, and logistics issues due to those H HOS rules. What is HOS? Uh, hours of service. Okay, got it. So there's yeah. only X amount of hours. I believe 11 uh, driver is allowed to drive. That makes sense. Yeah. And if there is a team driving, which is a two person team, right? One in the sleeper area, one, one in the sleeper, uh, yeah. Or in locomotion's case, one in one car and one in another car. Right. Uh, if it's team driving, they can perform really long trips, uh, but still it's a difficult job. And uh, refueling seems to eat time too. Refueling, idling, a lot of costs. And mm. uh, uh, I believe that. <clears throat> And it's it's actually a fact that uh, the workforce is uh, uh, retiring. Yeah, and, well, uh, we're facing that in manufacturing as well. I don't want to cut you off. Right, exactly. Um, in that space too. So that's why automation is making uh, big big growth in that industry as well. And uh, with the retiring workforce, and with less and less younger people joining that workforce, uh, autonomy is is a remedy. Uh, in to, to this industry. Yeah, I completely so, agree. I mean, it, it's cool to see the anal analogy there. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, that's, I was just talking about that earlier today. There was a Pittsburgh Venture Capital mm -hmm. Association uh, panel I was on um, as uh, in my capacity at FormLogic. And my thing is like, look, I mean, we're not getting people fired because nobody wants to do these jobs anymore. And there are machinists left, but, you know, they're retiring very quickly. Um, we're trying to make this job more interesting to young people by, you mm -hmm. know, getting you only the really, really fun parts and then letting you run way more machine tools at once, you know, so your your capacity right. is, is greatly increased as an individual. And I think that, I mean, some of the autonomous programs are similar. Absolutely. Uh, but just look at the AMR space, autonomous mobile robots. Yeah. Right? Thank it's, you for defining it. Yeah. <laughs> um, in case if I know, but the audience is yeah. curious. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> that space seen significant growth, in, 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 I'd say, in the past few years. You know when Fanuc introduces an offering, that's when it's like ready to pop. Right. <laughs> and uh, there's been so much adoption. And uh, we had COVID. Uh, we had... Uh, well, COVID was great for autonomy. I hate to say it, like it sounds kind of cold, but there were so many automation holdouts that I think were converted by that because nobody absolutely. wanted to leave their house. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And yeah. in the warehouse and logistics space, uh, autonomous mobile robots or cobots yeah. uh, made significant improvements. I was actually at um, a facility recently. I probably shouldn't say whose, mm -hmm. but um, they had a really interesting cobot program where they were taking full-size FANUC robots and they had area scanners, so like two-dimensional LIDAR and like 3D vision systems. Mm -hmm. So they could tell if a person was anywhere near the robot and they would shut it down. And it passed safety audit and it, it was a cool system. I mean, I, yeah. I saw people working alongside these things. Right. And I mean, you know, it, it was great because it was practical and you could mm -hmm. build way bigger and better stuff than you could with a traditional like universal robot or something like that. Yeah, and uh, interesting story, I was actually in Memphis um, last year and I went to uh, Autonomous Mobile Robot Conference. Now, oh, this cool. is a public information, and they took us to the... We sponsored their virtual event. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, super. Uh, uh, LSK, not at Formlogic. Okay. <laughs> so uh, they took us... Just being a double employee. <laughs> yeah. So they took us to uh, FedEx facility. Oh, those, empl those facilities are great. Yeah. Have you seen those? I have. Yeah. So I was really impressed because... Uh, I was too. They have... Uh, totally separate area for the lab and you can actually see these uh, uh, robots functioning and working. Also, uh, I mean, the use of conveyors in those facilities is right, incredible. Exactly. I haven't seen those, but I've seen yeah. the lab space where they had uh, uh, all these robots on the, on the display uh, performing certain tasks. Yeah. Uh, and they also had uh, security drones. That's it, because uh, I've only ever seen the production space for that. Right. So that's interesting. Yeah, and they had a security drone uh, that performed uh, uh, overall flight. Or like a night scope bowling pen or something different? Something, uh, no, it was a drone. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe maybe that's that one is a drone as well. It, it um, is not, it's a ground base. It's like a 600 pound thing that looks like a bowling pen. Yeah, I've seen those actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, actually, I, I, I got in trouble for trolling the, uh, the night scope investor emails a while ago. 
I, I sent a picture of the one that fell into a water feature at a mall, and the CEO emailed me back and was super upset. <laughs> you did not find it amusing at all. Oh, I believe that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've seen, we, we checked out those drones flying around the area, and they had uh, spot robots. Oh, cool. From uh, Boston Dynamics. And um, a lot of third parties actually buy these robots and they equip them with different security features. The spots? Yeah. Like, so, um, like what? Like a gun? Uh, not a gun yet. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of Black Mirror. Uh, oh, there was the uh, metalhead. Yeah, yeah, there was yeah. those little metalheads. That was uh, kind of creepy. Actually, one of SK's clients has a similar product um, and they were really upset by that episode. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. and so they they take those spot spot robots and uh, uh, they actually put uh, different equipment on it, such as cameras, some sensors, and they just roam the warehouses to check. Have you seen the spot cam yet? Uh, no. So what that is, it's really cool. It's from Carnegie Robotics here in Pittsburgh, and it's a uh, thirty thousand dollar unit that sits on top of it. It's got a three sixty cam, and then it's got a pan tilt unit with a zoom on it. So it's for reading gauges in a warehouse. So you can roam around the warehouse to spot, you know, do a new thing. And then, you know, you see like a boiler and you want to read the gauge on it and you just click on it with the, uh, the, the 360 cam. The pan tilt cam goes over, zooms in, and you can like 125 PSI, great, nominal, next gauge, you know. You can program those locations and just do a walkthrough. So it's really cool for kind of the stop gap. Right. That's actually... A uh, great example of how many use cases of, of, of robotics are there. You know, you can build robotics for uh, one thing, performing certain tax, task and improving operating efficiency. But then there will be um, entrants into the industry who build things on top of it. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. And that's a great parallel to uh, uh, autonomy as well. You know, one will have uh, autonomous vehicles on the road. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, services and, and technology companies that are built on top of it, including insurance, uh, which uh, would be awesome. Do. Yeah, because uh, that's a really critical part if you uh, want to deploy uh, autonomous vehicles on the road and if you want your clients, fleets, uh, trucking companies who are adopting these technologies uh, to be able to insure themselves. So that's a critical part too. So yeah, you are by law. like yeah. you said before, like travelers doesn't know how to do that. I mean, uh, well, insurance companies they they've done some great job understanding this, uh, and uh, so they didn't know how to do it last time I checked. They, Maybe you, they'll figure it out in the meantime. Uh, no, because it's a technical uh, problem. Uh, insurance companies are finan big financial institutions. They're not technologists, uh, and they're not in technology business. Frankly, it, it's not their uh, niche, right? Per se. Uh, so the best way for them is to partner with uh, Coop, someone like us, and uh, enter the industry that way. That's interesting. So yeah. you, you would work with an insurance agent and yeah. act sort of as like a right. That was like a bullshit detector, but uh, not quite. So okay. uh, there's a difference between an agent and a carrier. Yeah. Uh, so agent again is the one. Who Thank you for educating me. Right. I'm, I realize I'm stupid when it comes to this. Stuff. Oh no, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, insurance carrier is the one that takes the risk, right? Uh, and uh, the MJ model, how it works is that if an insurance company sees uh, a pricing mechanism and, and, and a model uh, that is focused in a certain industry, and it's something that insurance company itself requires longer time and effort uh, or maybe certain know-how to develop and they just don't have it, uh, they can partner with someone who does, right? There are numerous MGAs uh, across the country uh, in the insure tech space, small business MGAs, uh, real estate insurance MGAs, uh, just a few to name, right? Yeah. Uh, and they come in with their, uh, we'll call it capacity, uh, which means the capital, uh, and give you the pen to underwrite on their behalf. Yeah. Uh, capacity can be X amount of money. And you bring subject matter expertise, basically? Uh, right? You actually uh, sell their policy. So you okay. sell the insurance policy, right? Okay. You distribute insurance policy to the market, and uh, uh, the, the company behind you, for the sake of example, let's say there are three insurance companies who spread that risk, uh, will be able to pay the claims in the event of claims happening. 
right? Yeah. And uh, uh, the goal there, together uh, with insurance company, in partnerships with with insurance company, uh, get to the point where your they call it a loss ratio uh, is um, uh, below one hundred, which means you're uh, actually uh, paying out less claims. Uh, versus collect uh, premiums, right? Yeah, your goal, sense. your goal is to collect premiums. Otherwise, you'd go out of business. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's the fundamentals of a, a MGA model and how insurance works. It's make sure that your loss ratio is uh, uh, below hundred. Uh, and uh, to give you a great example, a trucking industry experienced uh, loss ratios overall over one hundred. Oh, geez. So they've been losing five to ten cents on the dollar. That's for, brutal. For a long time. Uh, there are many reasons for that, uh, such as nuclear verdicts. What's a um, nuclear verdict? A good question. Nuclear verdict is uh, uh, certain accidents where settlements cost tens of millions of dollars. Oh wow! Yeah. So insurance. I can see it's a nuclear verdict because it. it it's, it's big, yeah, yeah. and uh, you have uh, uh, different parties, from a driver to uh, a, a vehicle that the casualty that happened to the um, city if a barrier gets destroyed that actually would not be considered nuclear verdicts okay. are most common when there is a death on the road and the trucking accidents uh, are uh, can be uh, they say there's no price in a human life but it turns out 10 million dollars is the price on i mean kidding. yeah that's uh, <laughs> pretty bad so trucking yeah. accidents unfortunately uh, can be a uh, very uh, dangerous uh, from a casualty perspective sure uh, can cause um, certain casualties that cost significant amount of money, but most importantly, human lives, right? And that's why uh, everyone we believe and and the industry believes that uh, autonomous trucks will uh, uh, be a remedy uh, to this issue as well. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, and uh, we can avoid a lot of accidents that happened due to uh, driver falling asleep yeah and i actually had chatting from location yeah. in here a few episodes ago so mm -hmm. yeah so uh, you yeah. can uh, directly check check that video back on well, tekken's coming in yeah and in, in a few as well their cto so, super yeah. yeah i like those guys a lot no I, and i agree i mean from everything i've seen and learned and heard i mean I don't know. I, I could kind of see both sides. Like I've talked to bulls and bears on, on self-driving and I mean, humans are pretty good drivers, but I feel like robots are also pretty good drivers. Well, if we take trucking example specifically, yeah. um, truck drivers contribute a lot to the U.S. economy. They are the backbone uh, of the economy, right? Fourth largest industry, millions and millions of people employed. Uh, but there is, unfortunately, there is also a lot of cases of um, crazy accidents, like I mentioned, right? Well, it sounds situation. like a lot of that's the result of people exceeding that hours awake or hours on the road. Yes, and uh, there are, the industry consists of huge amount of small businesses. Uh, over 90%, I mean, almost 95, 95%, right? Don't quote me on that. Sure. Uh, our, Send all uh, hate mail to podcast to us, Katie. That's yeah. <laughs> our uh, small uh, businesses, right? And a lot of small businesses were not happy about the HOS rules because now they have to make less money because every hour counts. Uh, and there's been many instances where uh, companies actually drive more hours than they're supposed to. Yeah. And the sense. driver gets tired, right? Yeah. And falls I'm... asleep and that causes an accident. Yeah, it makes there, sense. And no, when you're driving something that is as massive as a truck, that accident is... Is very bad. Yeah. There's been a lot of cases like that. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of companies go out, go out of business because of it. Yeah, because you have to... Then the audit comes in. Uh, they start checking that. They start opening your logbooks where they log those hours. Oh, brutal. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a crime uh, to... Right now, it is a crime to drive over... Yeah, it makes sense. Rules. I'm sure they're doing it routinely to be able to hit better quotas for. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, I believe that uh, autonomous trucks uh, will be a great support, uh, especially for those long trips 
uh, on a highway, like yeah. you mentioned when you guys drove the flat states, right? Yeah. Uh, those flat states could be driven autonomously, right? Yeah. Uh, well, and also, or, or in shifts, like the locomotion. Or in model. shifts, exactly. Yeah. Which uh, is what we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or if you take Texas, yeah. the speed limits there, I think everyone drives faster in Texas yeah. overall. And speed is well, the speed limits are pretty high to begin with, right? Like, yeah. as I recall, it's like 75, 80 miles an hour. I think they're pretty high. Yeah. I'm, so if you I'm drive 90, Texas. maybe 110. Yeah. But I know that it's a, a particularly risky place for uh, for trucking, right? So, um, and uh, autonomous trucks, they will not violate that speed limit. Yeah. And they will not have HOS rules uh, and uh, help save a lot of lives. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's, um, I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, uh, trucking space. You should be. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, other big use cases such as robot taxis, uh, deliveries, and etc. Right? And uh, speaking about insurance, uh, in addition to uh, being at legal matter, right? You have yeah. to have insurance to be on the road. It's also a peace of mind for uh, fleet owners in the future who will be adopting these technologies and starting a business. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, having that peace of mind that, hey, uh, I have a specific insurance for autonomous truck or a robo taxi fleet uh, is uh, something really, you know, uh, crucial. Yeah, and I mean, like I said before, even for, you know, a robotics contract engineering company, it's not easy to find insurance. I mean, I assume it's similar for self-driving companies. Right now, yes. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, um, we'll get past that point. We'll Obviously, we will. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to. I mean, it's yeah. 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 Right. I'm sure there were insurance companies that were insuring horses uh, <laughs> with uh, with your thingy behind um, to carry people. Yep. Uh, but not, and then and then cars came out. They're like, "What the hell is this new fangled?" <laughs> Bullshit. Uh, yeah, I'm insure this piece of shit. Like, uh, yeah, do that? and uh, back then we had um, uh, fire insurance companies, you know, and uh, cargo insurance companies, uh, and Actually, all, I, all of them. I, I heard, and, and maybe this is the most politically correct, but my insurance agent told me that insurance started with the slave trade. That was like the first good that was ever insured. I, I don't think that's true. Okay, I want to hear why I'm wrong. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, and the uh, insurance uh, market in general started in London. Okay. Uh, so like Lloyd's of London? Lloyd's or... of London, yeah. right? And it started in a coffee shop. Wait, actually? Yes. So okay, I want, to, I want to hear your perspective on that. Right. Please. It started in a coffee shop where, um, uh, where uh, the ship owners would meet to drink coffee. Uh, and they were transporting different goods. Uh, and uh, I don't know what kind of goods. Uh, as <laughs> those were uh, terrible old times. So. Obviously. I mean, like, yeah. I'm not defending it. I just thought it was interesting. Right. Yeah. Uh, so insurance industry started in that coffee shop. Uh, the, the way we know it, Lloyd's of London. And uh, they were making deals there, talking. And uh, at some point, they decided uh, someone there. I don't quote me on that but you got to look up the history yeah for sure uh, don't remember right out of my head but um uh, they started actually insuring each other when would this have been uh that is in 1500s okay that is in 1500s so yeah that might have i mean there was a slave trade then but i don't know if that was the goods on the ships could have been tea could have been gunpowder i have no clue yeah <laughs> uh, i have no clue about what coffee was... The, the international, Could have been copy itself. The, you the, had to get that there. Maybe. So yeah. the sea trade was thriving. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 there were a lot of pirates. Uh, and uh, certain goods would not make it all the way. Right? They'd get stolen, etc. Yeah. Uh, well, not to mention, like, you have 100-foot swells in the North Atlantic. I'm sure that took a few ships without any pirates being involved. That could be the case. And uh, also uh, uh, these uh, trade deals in, in the coffee shop eventually turned out to become an insurance market cool uh, and they started insuring cargo ships themselves uh, and eventually that grew to uh, being a Lloyd's of London which is a historical place and uh, it's still there. in business 
absolutely. I've been there a few times, and fr uh, frankly, it's a capital of insurance. Uh, That's awesome. In the world and uh, really uh, cool, innovative guys there uh, coming nice. up with different insurance products, uh, different uh, new approaches to risks, and uh, uh, it's it's a very exciting place. That's really cool. I have not been there, so I'm jealous. It's it's interesting place. Yeah, and they have that gigantic underwriting floor where you see people just running around, hey, I got this risk. <laughs> That's how it worked. I'm, I'm just thinking of like the World Trade Center, like what it yeah, used it's, to be. It's, it's like, like New York. It's like the, yeah. the pits. In right. the trade so in the it's trade, like yeah. New York Stock Exchange back in the day where like people wave random papers, right? Yeah. <laughs> same. Yeah, same exactly. That's how it feels to me, what you're right. describing. Right. Yeah. Same thing in uh, Lloyd's. And uh, now it's definitely way more modernized. Um, there are more um, syndicates there who take unusual and important risks. Uh, and it, there, there's also a lot of funds who invest there as part of their diversific diversification strategy. Cool. That's really yeah. interesting. This is kind of tangential, but I actually have a friend that um, was in the World Trade Center during 9-11. And the only reason she lived is because she forgot her suit that day and got sent back home from work. <laughs> well, she, she got lucky. Yeah, she got very lucky. <laughs> she came back, the building was on fire. So, yeah. But, um, no, I mean, that, that whole industry to me is interesting because as an engineer, what I do is so separated. So, again, I kind yeah. of talked about this earlier. Like, I've always been jealous of, of the business people. I mean, it just seems glamorous. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, you guys are doing some great stuff. And we are really at the intersection of uh, technology uh, and uh, insurance. Uh, we have a heavy technology component <clears throat> to kind of step back into what we do. Uh, we enable data collection uh, from uh, autonomous uh, asset. Oh, cool. Let's say on-road asset. Yeah. Uh, and we enable data collection, uh, apply uh, our proprietary uh, underwriting models there, right? And uh, to be transparent, we're, we're building a lot of that stuff. We have certain pieces in place. Again, we're a seed company. Yeah. And uh, eventually we... I got news for you. have been Series A companies are building a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, Series B and C as well. I mean... Yeah, why yeah. not? Why yeah. not? You got to be building all the time, right? For sure. Uh, and then we have uh, insurance companies who can um, um, uh, provide the capacity, right? So we're building that underwriting engine based on the new forms of data that never existed before. Uh, that we make sense of from a risk perspective uh, so that in the nearest future we could underwrite and issue our policy forms. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, and you are based on real data, so I mean, you... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's that's super cool. This is a new data, um, new asset, and it's not like telematics from my previous job. Um, it's uh, telematics on steroids. You have an entire vehicle that is a telematics device collecting yeah. a lot of data and a lot more sensors right more sensors more data super super exciting that's really cool awesome well i feel like that's a good stopping point yeah do you, do you want to plug anything do you want me to list a website at the end of this um yeah you can coop.ai uh, coop.ai yeah. all right camera yeah. thanks for coming on it's been Absolutely. a pleasure nice to meet you Good to hang out with you. Yeah, <laughs> we met. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> yeah, met. Good to hang out with you. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.